restorative spells uh, create problems in storytelling. This is something that I did notice uh, a long time ago, back when I was playing 3rd edition, or specifically when I was running 3rd edition. Uh, and there was a sort of solution in 4th, though it did require some house ruling, and then it was fully reverted back in 5th. So let me explain what the problem is. So in 3rd edition and 5th edition, you have a lot of abilities that just straight remove problems. Any kind of bad thing that could be happening to someone, you have the ability to snap your fingers and say, that's not a thing anymore. Whether it be that you are bleeding out and dying, or you have some kind of curse, or you're dead, whatever it may be. Uh, a moderately leveled D&D party should be able to just wave these things away. Maybe there will be a material component cost. Maybe not. Um, in some cases there are, in some cases there aren't. Um, which creates an issue when I have, say, an NPC that is on the verge of death. Uh, they need medical attention. Uh, they're, they're like, they're, they're bleeding out. Maybe they have like some last words and then they die. Or, uh, or, you know, maybe there's, there's like, that creates a time crunch where they have to beat the bad guys in time to save the NPC. And if they don't do it fast enough, the NPC dies. Stakes. Um, Maybe there's, like, the mayor of the town is under a curse uh, that can't be removed. Or the whole town is under a curse that can't be removed. Um, you know, things like this. Problems that NPCs have. Or, you know, the king has been assassinated. Oh no, the king's been assassinated. Why would you not just re raise dead on them? Or resurrect, or whatever. Uh, steal the body. True resurrection. You know, there's... There's solutions for all these things that are relatively easy to come by. Because uh, all it takes is a spell slot. Uh, maybe some material components that, by that level, are pretty easy to come by. So, what do you do to create these kinds of stakes? I think in most cases, you just kind of have to give up. In If you're running 3rd edition or 5th edition, you kind of have to just give up on these being the types of plot points. Because someone bleeding out almost, almost dead on the verge of death like oh well healing word bonus action you have hit points now uh it starts from zero and you go up from there so now you have hit points you are not dying which kind of deflates the situation like i'm not saying that that's necessarily like a bad thing to be able to do but it's very easy it's very cheap and it's kind of assumed that the players are going to have access to these things. And so there, it's basically impossible to set up a situation like that where there is an NPC on the verge of death and the, they have to you know, work quickly to save them or, or whatever. There's, no, there's just no tension there. Um, now, you don't want to go in the opposite direction and say that players can't use any restorative abilities, which means that, like, any kind of curse or other long-term effects that normally would be removed by, say, a restoration spell or whatever, that none of that is available, because that creates some really feel-bad situations where, you know, somebody gets hit by one of these curses and they just don't have the tools to deal with it. It's kind of the problem with any kind of petrification ability before uh, uh, at level four or below, because the players literally can't have the tools necessary to deal with it unless you like give them a scroll of restoration or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, but having easy, cheap, and always on restorative powers that work on anyone really diffuses a lot of classic dramatic tension moments. In particular, dead NPCs. Uh, this is actually what sparked the uh, the, the conversation that uh, that led to this. Is talking about like you know, there's no tension for like important NPCs dying when the party can raise dead, or when the party gets access to true resurrection uh, because they can just re resurrect them. You know, if the campaign takes place over a month and someone who died back at level one that they want to restore, like, they just go back and raise dead, boom. Or I can't remember what the, the time limit is on raise dead. It might be shorter than a month. Um, 
you know, whatever that time frame is, now we have raised dead or now we have resurrection or now we have true resurrection and we go back and raise these people and now there are no consequences. Um, now there, obviously, there could be narrative consequences for someone who has been dead for a little while and has come back. But, uh, you know, there's... It, it deflates a classic point of tension of, like, important NPCs don't come back from death as easily as player characters. Um, which is kind of, like, kind of, there's, there's a sort of narrative dissonance there when it comes to, like, monarchs, um, who should have the resources and the staff necessary to bring them back, uh, if they should die. Um, and so, like, the, the, the king has been assassinated should basically never be a thing. It shouldn't even make the news, uh, cause they should be raised before word even escapes the castle. <clears throat> um, and if that doesn't happen, you have to come up with some really good and generally convoluted reason as to why. Now, what is the solution for this? Um, I think that, uh, particularly for, I have solutions for healing and I have solutions for raising. I don't really have an excellent solution for uh, removing of other conditions, uh, but let's go over these two. So for healing, uh, in third edition and in fifth edition, there's very much a sense, though it is not technically written in the rules, but there's very much a sense that hit points refer to your capacity to sustain physical trauma. If you get hit, if that is if somebody meets or beats your AC with an attack. You are impacted by that attack. The arrow goes in. The axe lands. This is the idea. This is the this is what the game system and mechanics evoke. Though it the the I think I want to say it's in the DMG. It might actually be in the player's handbook. It does say that like hit points represent your ability to shrug off or avoid damage or avoid a, a lethal blow. Um, it's very much treated as though it is physical trauma. In that, aside from hit dice, nearly all healing is magical. And it is very difficult to come across any non-magical healing. Um, and non-magical healing is always worse than magical healing. Um, which makes a kind of sense. If you have a, a grievous open wound, you should expect that magical healing to close the wound would be better than non-magical healing allowing you to ignore the damage and sort of press on regardless. Uh, fourth edition took a very different approach and it was much more explicit that hit points are a matter of like fatigue and luck and determination, willpower, and these are the things that allow you to press on despite the cuts and the bruises and the injury. Um, you know, you, you might get hit by something, but it's not breaking bones. It's not, op you know, opening your flesh. There's not physical trauma as much as there is just a sort of wearing down of morale. Morale really is a better description for hit points than actual, like, health. Despite hit points classically being tied to constitution. Um, what this means is that not only are they non-magical sources of healing that compete with and sometimes even succeed, exceed magical healing because it is just a matter of morale. The warlord can say, get back in there. You know, we're, the, the day is ours. Inspiring word. You get back hit points and you press on regardless. You, you know, you still feel the pain. You still have the aches, but you're pressing on regardless because the warlord has inspired you to do so. But what this means is that when you describe that someone is like bleeding out, like their throat's been cut or, you know, their, their guts open, they are dying. That means that healing abilities that restore hit points aren't going to do anything for them because you aren't closing wounds. You are allowing someone to ignore superficial injuries. You are allowing them to overcome negative morale. But when someone is bleeding out, those things don't really matter. They can just actually die, physically die, and no amount of morale is going to stop them. Stop that. Um, so what I did when I ran 4th edition was that whenever there was an actual physical injury, a broken bone, uh, a, a bleeding wound, anything like that, I would use the uh, the disease track. Uh, the, the same mechanics that they use for, like, diseases and how they would progress back and forth based on endurance rolls and medicine checks and things like that. Um, 
these are the things that I would do for actual physical injuries. Um, and there's a lot fewer tools that players have to sort of instantly overcome that problem. Uh, there are ways to remove poisons and diseases, but physical injuries, not so much. And you kind of have to go through the, the narratively more sensible and more familiar steps of like a heel check, you know, to apply medicine, giving them a bonus on their endurance check to overcome this and actually progress, uh, progress towards recovery over time. Uh, and I think that's a much more satisfying way to handle physical injury rather than just, I have a, uh, uh, a quick, easy, cheap ability that gives you more hit points. And so you're not going to die. Um, so that's for injury for resurrection. Um, and this was not the case in fourth edition in fourth edition, the raised dead ritual, which was the only way to bring someone back from death. Uh, to bring other people back from death, I should say. Um, the raised dead ritual uh, did allow you to target anybody. What I would propose, uh, and, and so, let me back up a second. Allowing a raised dead ritual to target anybody kind of creates the same issue as it is in third edition and fifth edition where death is not meaningful as a consequence for NPCs. Yeah, sure, you could say that the king is epic level, so it's going to take 50,000 gold to resurrect, and oops, you guys are like early paragons, so you don't have that much money. But is the king epic level? Like, if they had to, if you had to assign stats to them, would that be reflected in their attack bonus, defenses, hit points, that kind of thing? Probably not. Most nobility, with some exceptions, obviously, um, most of, especially if like he's just getting gacked as an assassination, like that's that's not representative of an epic level character. And so it would be a little bit dishonest to describe him as such just to jack the price up. What I would propose is that for resurrection abilities, any kind of raised dead, resurrection, true resurrection, any of that, it only works for characters who have not yet achieved their destiny, they have a destiny and they have not achieved it yet, or who have died before their appointed time. Now, this kind of gets into a little bit into world building. You have to assume that there is a destiny for people. Like there are things that they are supposed to accomplish. There is a specific time and place where they are supposed to die, uh, but those can be overwritten. You know, if a bad guy comes in and murders somebody, that is not their appointed time. They've just been murdered. Um, or maybe they were supposed to be murdered. Who can say? We can say we are the players. And so lines of text that refer to this kind of thing would be sort of a wink at the players saying, hey, player characters have not yet achieved their destiny before the end of the campaign. Player characters, uh, if they die, it's before their time. Everyone else, that's destiny. That's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, and so uh, by having that kind of text in there, uh, you, you restrict it to only resurrecting player characters because it's important that death is not the end for player characters in a game where people can kind of die randomly and unexpectedly. I think that's important. And that could be a whole other discussion on its own. Um, but I think having resurrection for player characters is good. Having it for NPCs, less good. It creates thematic problems. Then we get back to like diseases and curses and things like that. And that's... That's a whole other can of worms. I don't really have a great solution for it other than to look at the way that 4th edition did the remove affliction ritual, which requires a die roll with a penalty based on the level of the effect that is being removed. So you can have higher level effects that lower level characters cannot remove. And so you don't just get to snap your fingers and remove all poisons or all diseases or whatever, or all curses. You can remove one effect and it is more difficult if it is higher level. And that's kind of the, the, the best way to make such an ability acceptable. Um, uh, cause then you could just say like, this is too high level for you to remove. Uh, or if you, if it's not, then why are the player characters struggling to remove it? They shouldn't, right? So that would, that would work out either way. So anyways, those are my thoughts on the issues with restorative abilities in RPGs and the narrative difficulties that they can create. Um, yeah, uh, that's more or less it. Uh, and this is 
this is something that I've kind of had in the back of my mind for a long time. I noticed it in third edition. I was able to implement a solution in fourth. In fifth, the solutions kind of don't work that well. Uh, but maybe you can uh, modify your game to uh, to accommodate for it. Or maybe you've been struggling with this very same thing and now you have the tools to articulate it. And so if that is the case, I am grateful to be of help.